I'm Sarah. And I'm Jackie. Now, before we begin, I just want everyone to pause, take a deep breath, and appreciate the fact that you're on break, everyone. Most of us are going home, but if you're sticking around, here, there's some great things to do during the break. Besides enjoying all the available parking and the speedy Wi-Fi, you can check out the Zoo Lights for just $5, thanks to student activities, now through January 5th. Wherever you are this Christmas, we hope you have a merry one. And speaking of Christmas, students, faculty, and their families gathered in Sanders Court earlier this month to celebrate the annual Christmas tree lighting with cookies and caroling. President Armstrong and Pastor Dave addressed the crowd, and student body president Stephanie Routson led the countdown. And you know, CCU has its own Christmas tradition with the Christmas concert. It was a wonderful performance, but if you missed it, don't worry because Shelby and Kaylee are bringing something to you. Oh, that's a great question. You know, I think I think seeing all of the students on stage and realizing there are 180 students up there and we're all working together and it's it's really beautiful. It's wonderful. Just seeing everybody involved. Actually, you know, one of my favorite parts is seeing how everybody pulls together to put all the stage together. I've worked taught at other universities. This is the only place where you can say, we need a group of people to do this, to do that, or to do something, and they come out of the woodwork. So they've been setting up all morning, and then we have a five-hour rehearsal, and they'll tear down tomorrow. Everybody works together. So it's the people. I think one of my favorite parts um, this year is in general just anytime all of the choirs and ensembles and strings all get to play together because we just don't get to do a lot in the music school all at the same time and so whenever we get to the Christmas concert that's something I always look forward to is hearing that sound of all of our gifts sounding at once. It's by far the best one I've ever played in myself and I've played with all kinds of groups as a horn player. Um, I like that they center it on God though. Interview bomber right there. What a fun behind the scenes look. Speaking of behind the scenes, don't you have an update for us on construction? Absolutely. While we're all on break, I wanted to update you all on what to expect on campus for construction when we get back. I sat down with Shannon Dreyfus last week to hear what's next for our campus update. Take a look. It's been almost a full semester since we've had a consistent presence of construction on campus. CCU is a beautiful academic hall and residence hall, but what's next? I sat down with Shannon Dreyfus to find out. My name is Shannon Dreyfus. I'm the vice president here at CCU, and I work uh, very closely with the president on new campus development. That's the real focus of my job here. The next building is a new student center, and so as part of the tail end of the new Yetter Hall, we demolish the old Yetter Hall. It's going to be a 60,000 square foot building, so it'll be 50% larger than La Prino, and uh, we're hoping to break ground on that in the first part of 2016. The new student center will have a great hall, a dining center, fitness center, and several offices. How will all this be paid for? Shannon shares there are three major sources of income. A, a big part of it is philanthropy. So there are um, individuals um, who love CCU and are engaged in the mission, mission of CCU, and so they give money towards the development of the campus. Another source of funds is the, the positive cash that's just 
earned by the business. And so the president and Dan Kaur is the CFO and a lot of the members of the school um, are very attuned to operating the organization in a, uh, a good conservative mode of stewardship so that any extra money that we earn, we invest back in the organization. Um, the last source of funds uh, that, that really is provided by God, I think, is we've got some investment income from some property that we've had in Morrison for many, many years. And so at one time that was to be considered where the school would relocate. One of the things when the president came was he looked at that property and said, you know what, That's, it's a beautiful piece of property, but it's not the right location for the campus. And so over the years, um, as conditions warranted and, and things started to happen, we were able to, to rezone that property and we've got a development partner that's helping us develop that property for single family homes. And as a result, we get cash that we can then invest in the Lakewood campus. Shannon did say we will lose some parking, but it will be replaced with a green space for students to hang out. This does not include the volleyball courts, but he assured me they will put some at the end of the way departments very soon. This has been your campus update with Jackie Reister. You know, campus construction is both exciting and annoying because on the one hand, it's really cool to see what comes up right before our very eyes. On the other hand, it's a little bit of a hassle, but that's pretty cool. Absolutely. I think any part of development in CCU just furthers our ministry. And you know that's exactly what we're highlighting with our Cougar Spotlight, Kaylee, about Sojourners. Well, I would say my favorite part about being in Sojourners is just being able to interact with the people. I mean, you know, these people don't have a lot. They've been on the streets. Many of them have been on the streets, gotten off the streets, gotten back on the streets. And you just, being able to build those relationships with them is really my favorite part. You know, just we all have the same problems. And it's so easy to forget that they're just like, it's so easy to walk by homeless people and think like, oh man, they got themselves there, like there's another drug here, you know? And it's just like, we actually listen to their stories and it can happen to any one of us. We can all end up in those situations. And if you strip it back down enough, we all have the same problem. So we did sojourns over the summer, a friend of mine and myself, and we just kind of did it ourselves. And we took food out there and we were talking to these people that we know pretty well. And this guy came up in the, out of the middle of nowhere and didn't say anything and just started preaching to us. And he just. I would say my favorite part about being up in sojourners is the people and being able to walk down the streets and bring the gospel. Um, not necessarily in the words that we say, but like bringing the gospel and love. Sojourners, uh, we're a family, we're a group of people, um, a group of friends that really love each other, we hang out outside of the group, um, we're very welcoming. Favorite part, you know, just building relationships with people and what they give to us as well, just, you know, we go down there thinking we're serving them, but so many times they serve us. Thanks, Kaylee. Earlier this month, CCU students were treated to an exclusive screening of the award-winning documentary, Poverty, Inc. The film discusses the effects of foreign aid and non-governmental agencies in developing nations. The filmmakers say of their work, Poverty, Inc. follows the butterfly effect of our most well-intentioned efforts and pulls back the curtain on the poverty industrial complex, the multi-billion dollar market of NGOs, multilateral agencies, and for-profit aid contractors. Are we catalyzing development or are we propagating the system in which the poor stay poor while the rich get hipper? The director of photography, Simon Sianco, was in the Beckman Center packed with students there for free Chick-fil-A and extra credit to answer questions. What are the odds? Good. What each of these delegates said was now been cut down because of cheap Western dumping foreign aid into those cold Airport I went to. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first time I've got that question. That, 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 that's a good one. Um, that's, a, that's a good question, y'all. I haven't. That's an awesome opportunity. Did you get to see the film? I did. It was really interesting. It's a tough question to grapple with, you know, whether we're actually doing more harm than good. Right. And I think it's cool, too, that the director of photography was there. I think CCU has been privileged to host several distinguished speakers on campus, such as Supreme Court Justice Scalia, presidential candidate Ben Carson, and on the 74th anniversary of Pearl Harbor, former Vice President Dick Cheney. Cheney spoke on his new book, Exceptional, Why the World Needs a Powerful America, and answered questions from CCU guest professor Hugh Hewitt. On December 7th, Dick Cheney, the 46th Vice President of the United States, came to campus. He spoke on various issues of foreign and domestic policy, including gridlock in Congress and the rise of Islamic State. 
So for us to think that somehow we're safer than we were at the time of 9-11, I think, I think the world's a much more dangerous place. I think our adversaries are deadlier. I think they've spread pretty dramatically from a geographical standpoint. I think ISIS is a whole new ball game, tougher, meaner, more vicious than, uh, than we had in Al-Qaeda. Cheney also took some questions from the audience, one of which was personal. The student asked Cheney to speak about his faith. I am a Christian. Um, I was raised uh, in the Methodist Church and uh, um, married a woman in the, from the Presbyterian Church, and we got married in an Episcopal Church, kind of genetic. Um, but I, having just been through um, serious heart problems a few years ago, I had the personal experience. I'd, uh, uh, by the time I laid 17 months after I left the White House, I was in end stage heart failure. Um, I went through a very, very difficult um, set of surgeries to put in a pump that bought me 20 months that got me to the point where I could get a heart transplant four years ago, March. Um, that was a religious experience. There's no question in my mind, but what uh, thanks not only obviously to a donor and to modern medical technology, uh, but thanks to the prayers of uh, thousands of people all over the country who, uh, who prayed for me. Dick Cheney's visit to CCU was orchestrated by the Centennial Institute. To see more distinguished speakers, check out the ccu.edu slash centennial website. It's really neat how we get to be prominent in the Denver and Lakewood community by bringing such great speakers to campus. And speaking of Denver, it's known as the nationwide as the Mile High City. And since the legalization of marijuana in 2012, that city nickname has become something of a double entendre. The city of Lakewood, however, isn't so fond of the slogan, and the city council is voting on an ordinance that would outlaw the cultivation of all medical marijuana plants in Lakewood. The city wants to maintain neighborhoods that are crime-free, odor-free, and do not unfairly impinge on the desired lifestyle of the community, and they're up against a deadline. On March 1st, the Medical Marijuana Regulation and Safety Act, boy that's a mouthful, goes into effect statewide, creating a multi-agency framework on the cultivation, distribution, and sale of cannabis. If you're interested in learning more or chiming in on the conversation, a public hearing on the proposed ordinance is set for January 12th right here in Lakewood. You know, that's such an amazing thing that it's still a prevalent topic even now in Lakewood. Oh, it's going to be a hot topic for many years to come, I'm sure. What I love about CCU is that we get to cover hot topics such as this through the Centennial Institute, which um, until recently has been directed by John Andrews. Jared Cummings sat down with him to tell us more about his retirement. On December 17th, John Andrews stepped down from his position as the director of Centennial Institute, CCU's public policy think tank. John Andrews' journey to CCU had humble beginnings. It started at a 2008 dinner conversation with Bill Armstrong. I was at an election night dinner that President Bill Armstrong was holding in honor of his son who was in a bitterly fought Republican congressional uh, primary nominating battle. Will Armstrong, President Armstrong's son, fell short in that election, but uh, over the course of the dinner, the president heard that I was leaving my previous job with Claremont Institute out of Southern California, taking a few months to write a book which became Responsibility Reborn, now in circulation here on campus, and uh, I didn't know what I was doing next. President Armstrong, his vision, having taken over the university in 2006, included much more outreach and public policy. The outreach Armstrong had in mind was an on-campus think tank. Knowing John's experience, he offered him a job on the spot. He knew that I had worked in this field before. In fact, I had worked in four different public policy think tanks. <laughs> and he asked me if number five could be helping him start Centennial Institute here at CCU. I was ushered into a, a bare office uh, right here in Beckman on the 1st of February 2009. I didn't know hardly a soul on campus, certainly didn't know any of the students. I had no staff. I was borrowing staff from the president's front office. I didn't quite know what the program of Centennial Institute would be. Since coming to CCU, John Andrews has grown the Centennial Institute into a national force for liberty, conservative principles, and Judeo-Christian values. The Institute is most famous for hosting the Western Conservative Summit, which is the largest annual gathering of conservative leaders west of the Mississippi, and for putting on Issue Monday forums for the public. 
There have been many hardships and highlights, but here are some of John's favorites. Working with CCU students, creating the Western Conservative Summit, and building staying power into Centennial Institute as a voice for faith, family, and freedom decades to come. John Andrews has helped put CCU on the map, inspired a new generation of conservative leaders, and forever impacted the realm of public policy. In honor of his service, we at CCU TV would like to thank Mr. Andrews for his role and wish him best of luck on the next adventure. This has been Jared Cummings with CCU TV. John Andrews surely will be missed around here. President Obama addressed the nation from the Oval Office in response to the shooting in San Bernardino, California. The president confirmed that the massacre was indeed a terrorist attack, the worst since 9-11. In his speech, Mr. Obama vowed to destroy ISIL and also called for stricter gun control laws in the United States. To hear more about this, we have Jared with Something Political in Studio B. The headlines read shooting. Democrats shout gun control. Republicans cry foul and call for prayer. Twitter tweets, Facebook shares, and the media looks to Obama. What does he say? In the last month, two major killings have taken place. On November 27th, three people were killed and nine injured at a Planned Parenthood facility in Colorado Springs. The culprit was a white man named Robert Louis Deere, who told detectives no more baby parts after being detained. On December 2nd, 14 people were killed and 17 injured at a disability center in San Bernardino, California. The perpetrators were an Arab Muslim married couple, Saeed Farouk and Tashfin Malik. The couple had pledged allegiance to ISIS over social media prior to the attack. In response to the terror attack at Planned Parenthood, President Obama called for gun control. In the end of the day, Congress, states, local governments are going to have to act uh, in order to make sure that we're preventing people who are deranged or uh, have violent tendencies from getting weapons that can magnify the damage that they do. In California, Obama once again called for gun control. We also need to make it harder for people to buy powerful assault weapons like the ones that were used in San Bernardino. He also cautioned Americans from becoming unnecessarily fearful and suspicious of Muslims. If we're to succeed in defeating terrorism, we must enlist Muslim communities as some of our strongest allies, rather than push them away through suspicion and hate. But just as it is the responsibility of Muslims around the world to root out misguided ideas that lead to radicalization, it is the responsibility of all Americans, of every faith, to reject discrimination. As Americans and as Christians who care for the victims, who empathize with their families and desire peace and safety, we have every right to be outraged by these atrocious acts of violence, acts which are religiously intolerant and destroy human dignity. At the same time, we must carefully consider these emotions when it comes to public policy. Rash and ill-informed decisions are bad decisions even if we get the satisfaction of doing something quickly. President Obama has politicized these tragedies into rallies for gun control. Is he right in doing this? Will controlling the sale of guns actually stop violence? There is no one-size-fits-all public policy solution to violence, but we do know that individuals who are loved and know that their creator truly loves them become secure in themselves and are highly unlikely to commit mass acts of violence. This is why Martin Luther King said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive, drive out hate, only love can do that. Love truly does cover a multitude of sins, but when it comes to public safety, an officer on site is usually the surest form of protection. To prevent terrorism, you need an anti-terrorist. These great defenders of freedom wear uniforms. They are policemen, soldiers, security officers, and local citizens with concealed carry permits. So you should know your surroundings, know your coworkers, and if you have the chance, always look to incorporate armed security guards at your events. As Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman notes, the only thing which can stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with one. Thanks, Jared. On a lighter note, Nixon Studio B to talk a little bit about the upcoming Star Wars premiere. 
Over the years, Star Wars has truly left a lineage behind that's been passed down from generation to generation since its release. And can these movies that come out really live up to the expectations, especially for this generation, and with the prequels being how they were and people not really accepting them? We asked around also to find out to see if other people would appreciate these movies as well. To be honest, I'm still kind of coming to grips with the fact that there's a new episode of the Star Wars saga coming out next week. I mean, how crazy is that? I mean, obviously, obviously there was a lot of hype surrounding episode one back in 1999 when it came out. And everybody hates that film these days, apparently. Um, not not me, but most everybody else. Um, so there's there's a lot of hopes with this film because they're bringing back the old cast and a lot of the old crew that things will be different this time around and be a lot more worthwhile. Um, however, if those hopes aren't met, we can see a lot of disappointed and angry fans. I'm going to be happy one way or the other because we have Han, Luke, and Leia back. But Though there are many people excited to see this film, there are some who believe there is far too much hype for this movie. Well... I mean, I think that as a, like, total, Star Wars is, like, okay, but I'm not, like, really super into it. So, like, with this new movie coming out, it's, like, just pretty much meh. Like, I don't even think I'll really go and see it unless I have friends that go and see it or, like, my family really wants me to go with them and see it or something. I sure will be going to the premiere of that one. Speaking of Studio B, Jackie, aren't you supposed to be over there for sports? Yeah, you know, I should really. <laughs> this semester is finally finished, but before you pack up and leave, be sure to catch the women's and men's basketball team on Friday and Saturday night in the event center at 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. Both men and women will be taking on Westminster College and Colorado Mesa. If you're staying on campus over break, the men and women will be playing several games, so be sure to check out ccucougars.com for more details. Then, when you get back, the men and women will play on the 22nd and 23rd at 5 and 7 against Western State and CSU. Also on the 22nd, CCU's hockey team will be playing at the Pepsi Center before the professional Avalanche team at 3.30. This will be a huge event to come see our Cougars play, then stay for our Colorado Avalanche. Enjoy your break. Thanks, Jackie. Besides representing the student body at events like the tree lighting, Stephanie Routson, our student body president, is an active advocate on campus of many other important issues. I stepped into Studio B with her earlier today to discuss her upcoming trip to Israel. Take a look. I'm here in Studio B with our student body president, Stephanie Routson, to talk about her upcoming trip to Israel. So, Stephanie, tell me a little bit about what you're going to be doing in Israel this winter break. Well, this, this winter break, I will be traveling to Israel with the Zionist Organization of America. I received a Fulbright scholarship with them on their campus advocacy side to tour the, the whole entire country, um, all the way down from the Negev, all the way up to Jerusalem, to Tel Aviv, and even the strategic borders of the Golan Heights, um, where they're bordered with Lebanon and Syria and Jordan. I'm going to get to see all those. Um, I'll be touring with Israel Defense Forces. I'll be hearing um, Middle Eastern briefings from their side and um, learn about Israel from a political aspect. So I think it's um, an awesome way. To, I mean, what other, what better way to spend Christmas than in the Holy Land, especially in Bethlehem? I'll also be spending time in the Palestinian territories. Um, I'll be meeting people on the ground and just getting a first-hand experience of what it's really like in the Holy Land and what it's like in modern-day Israel. That sounds really, really exciting. i am got to say I'm really jealous. But um, what I'd like to know is just, because you are a student body president, we're all, we are a very politically active campus. What are you hoping to bring back from this trip to benefit the student body and encourage more activism on campus in relation to Israel? I am so glad you asked that question. One of the reasons why I even wanted to run for student body president in the first place is because I really wanted CSU to continue to be a pro-Israel campus. And one thing I'll be doing is coming back with more connections, and I'll be coming back with these advocacy resources with this, with this wonderful organization called the Zionist Organization, who offers um, free scholarships to Israel every winter to students who are interested in uh, learning about the U.S.-Israel relationship. I also work with other prolific organizations called APAC and Christians United for Israel as well. So how can students get involved? 
Um, well, first of all, they can get, become a part of our Students for Israel Club I started here on campus. And I work with, um, again, the Zionist Organization of America, APAC, and CUFI. Um, they have applications available all year round for um, scholarships to Israel. And as soon as I find a student, who, a student who is interested in going, I can just send them an application. They can fill it out. Um, it's as easy as that, and they can be on a plane to Israel soon. It's, wow. it's that easy to get involved. Wow. Well, mm -hmm. that's really exciting. Yeah. Well, we wish you the best on your trip, and we can't wait to hear about all your adventures when you come back. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Bye. It looks like a really great trip. I'm super jealous. You know, but not all of us can go to Jerusalem. So if you're stuck at home and maybe you're a gamer, check out with Nick and Studio B about Tech Bite. This week's Tech Byte is going to be very Sony heavy. The video game conference, the PlayStation Experience, revealed many exciting details for gaming fans. First off, Ratchet & Clank from Insomniac Games gets a reimagined release on April 4th. This is a revisitation of the first video game in the series with a complete overhaul on the PlayStation exclusive. Gamers should expect a new look with the graphics but still feel that classic third person shooter. This game is also an adaptation to its featured film that will release later that month. So if you're looking to make your enemies dance with disco fever or rediscover a childhood memory of yours, be prepared for a timeless adventure. While we're on the nostalgia train, a remake of Final Fantasy VII has gameplay footage that is baffling gamers. The 1997 classic created by Square Enix has given up its turn-based fighting system for more fast-paced action-oriented gameplay to fit in with the newer games in the series. This newer form of combat can be troublesome news for those who are wanting a more pure remake. Despite hesitation from the gamers, some pretty positive feedback is flooding into this gaming community. The fighting isn't the only portion being revamped. Square Enix stated in a press release that it will be told across a multi-part series with each entry providing its own unique experience. This game has yet to have a release date and is still in its early development phase. I'm Nicholas LaGuardia, and this has been your CCU Tech Bite. Thanks, Nick. That's all we have for you this time. Have a Merry Christmas, CCU, and a wonderful break. And don't forget to subscribe.